I'm Teresa Caraggio, and this is Third Paradigm. Today, my topic is tonic masculinity and feminine wiles. It was prompted because the other week I was reading, as I do every week, Rob Bresney's Free Will Astrology, which is an amazing blend of ancient and contemporary wisdom traditions. I've quoted from it in many of my episodes. And it blends together the personal, the political, the spiritual, and is right up my alley. In this case, my post got back. You have been banned from posting for the next 100 years. So that was at least good timing since it was the day before my annual subscription would renew. On the same day, I found that my subscription to Robert Malone had been revoked and the remainder refunded, which is not a surprise. He has an asshole's rule, as he calls it, of three strikes and you're banned from his life. I had posted two episodes and one interview with Fintan Dunn calling into question whether his $25 million lawsuit against the Bregans was an act of intimidation. Since then, I've had less cognitive dissonance because I don't have the contrast between his words, with which I generally agree, and his actions, with both the lawsuit and still having one foot in the door with the DOD and the NIH. In Rob Bresney's case, I had to think back to remember the last comment that I had posted since his ban had erased all signs of my existence. And then I remembered his essay, Aspiring to Express Sublime Feminine Intelligence. I had hoped that he would take my comment as constructive criticism that I didn't think that men should be telling women what feminine intelligence was. Apparently not. His post began with this, asking what are the qualities of people who embody sublime feminine intelligence as I aspire to do. And some of them I agreed with, some felt to me like liberal tropes. He writes, they are lovers of equality, activists committed to social and economic justice in service to people who are from disadvantaged backgrounds excited to protect and preserve the health of the natural world, passionate about diminishing militarism, plutocracy, bigotry, misogyny, and racism. I feel like every time someone has to clarify that they're for equality, there's an unspoken that other people are not, because otherwise, why would they need to state it? It's as if they're telling the listener, okay, unlike you, I'm for equality. It implies a moral inferiority that I think is a contradiction in terms. I was just walking around my daughter's home in Oakland and every third house has Black Lives Matter posted on the lawn and the ones in between have flags with Ukrainian Lives Matter or love is love and then a whole list for what that house stands for. But I also noticed that no one would smile back. No one would look me in the eye or say hello. And my daughter says that she's gave up after the first couple years in Oakland, that it was just too hard to always be getting that rejection. So I don't know what it means when Your lawn has all of these different affirmations, but you don't engage with the people who are in front of your face. Rob writes of the sublimely feminine, they consider the needs of as many people as possible, not just the needs of their immediate community and network of allies. Really? Is that what smart women do? because most of the moms that I know are considering the needs of their kids. And I don't know how many people's needs any of us is capable of fulfilling, including Rob. He continues, They proceed as if loving and caring for animals and plants and the earth is a prime test of our spiritual intentions. 
This is true of the World Economic Forum, who would like us to think that being vegetarians and eating bugs is the way to protect the planet. But most of the moms that I know could not give a fig for what supreme spiritual test of our intentions is. We are busy. He adds, they are not fundamentalists or authoritarians who believe that only their truths are true. They are willing to consider the value of alternate points of view. They are open to the perspective that everyone has a piece of the truth and no one has the entire truth. They aspire to regard everyone as a potential teacher. He admonishes women to be extra bold and brave as you say what you genuinely think and feel and mean. If you're a man, foster your skills at listening to women and non-binary people. Give them abundant space and welcome to speak their truths. Well, I guess unless they're critical of you. Rob's list contains what he regards as generically good qualities, and he sees these as ones that men should aspire to, while non-binary persons are already there. But there's nothing inherently feminine about those qualities. How could there be if men should aspire to it and non-binary people are already it? I think that there is a way that women think that is inherently different. It's not just a state of mind. It's part of having birthed and nurtured and nursed children. And that changes you. That changes how you think forever. You can't fool yourself anymore that things like profit margins and male egos are really important things. When I say that I think like a woman, I don't mean that I think emotionally. I am the most logical, methodical, analytical person that I know. But even though my focus is on traditionally masculine areas of things like geopolitics and economics and theology, my application of those things is always as a mother. I don't have any use for philosophical arguments that don't really have a purpose other than showing who's smarter than somebody else. What I'm always looking at is what does this mean in terms of the world that I want my daughters to live in? So there's a Tao Te Ching quote, which goes, if there is radiance in the spirit, it will abound in the family. If there is radiance in the family, it will abound in the community. If there is radiance in the community, it will grow in the nation. If there is radiance in the nation, the universe will flourish. The word radiance, I'm informed by a site called Word Foolery, was coined by Shakespeare in All's Well That Ends Well, when Helena says, "'Twere all one that I should love a bright particular star and think to wed it, he is so above me in his bright radiance and collateral light. While we admire that other phrase, collateral light, I think it's important to keep in mind that the Fuegians from my former episode had 60% more words in their vocabulary than the ones that Shakespeare used, including the 1700 that he coined. So imagine the nuances of relationships that Shakespeare would have been able to express in the Fuegian vocabulary, or maybe a less smitten Helena. I think that the radiance that the Tao is talking about is the maternal hearth. There's a TikTok that my daughter Veronica showed me where a woman, while putting on makeup, which I guess is the TikTok thing, talks about how she used to see it as an imposition that whenever she was in a bad mood, so was everyone else in the household. And then she recognized the power that was in that. And she realized that if she takes care of herself and takes responsibility for her own happiness, that that then radiates to the rest of the family and they can bask in her collateral light. As a mother, I see the purpose of our society 
any society, any species, as raising the next generation to take responsibility for themselves, for each other, for us, and for their own children. Now, we can measure using analysis how well our society is doing that and how well our economy serves that goal. You might say we don't need to, that we already know it's failing, but we really do because metrics are the masculine proof points to the feminine goal. There are many notable women who have come into prominence by calibrating the failures of the COVID vaccine. Yet it seems to me that it's still the men who have the big platforms who then feature the women on them. In geopolitics, economics, journalism, I think it's the same. There are some couples who are more or less equal, but I think that generally the women are a little less in terms of interviews and prominence and status. Some of the women write with a very decidedly masculine in-your-face style and often have a predominantly masculine audience. And then there are men, chief among them, which is a notable term, Rob Bresney and Charles Eisenstein, who write with a very intuitive feminine style and who I think have more women than men who are reading them. All of these people are teaching new things and writing in ways that are informative and refreshing. I don't have a criticism of what they're doing, but I wonder, is there a way where we can have both? A decade ago, I read a study that looked at the dynamics of mixed gender work groups. What it found was that when women made an idea or a proposal or a solution, it was most often passed over in the discussion that the next comment just went on as if it hadn't even occurred. It wasn't argued and it wasn't shot down. This validated my experience in group after group, from church groups to Bible studies to Grange groups to book studies, to even groups that I had started myself. Women are expected to be conciliatory and inclusive. They are expected to make sure that it's fair and that everyone's ideas are being voiced and that there is an equality to those ideas and discussions. They're not expected to be leaders unless they look at that as an administrative role and don't actually want to lead anywhere. To get around this, I once developed a problem-solving process that looked at ideas and judged them according to how they met a group-determined criteria. It involved things like acknowledging the intentions of everyone and factored in anyone's willingness to do the work to make the solution happen. Even that was shot down by the group before they even heard it. So. I've thought sometimes that if I could find a man who would just take my ideas and run with them, I would gladly hand them over and go back to writing poetry. But I've come to believe that it's not just my ideas that the world needs in them, that it's also the voice backing them and the perspective that I bring as a woman. As I wrote on Tessalina's Substack, if there's a lesson for me in all of this infighting, it's really and truly to give up on the idea that there's some prestigious man out there who's going to recognize the genius of what I'm saying and launch me into having an audience. What I'm saying will be heard when the time is ripe and not a moment sooner. Thanks be to the great choreographer. I look at you, Jessica Rose, Margaret Anna Alice, and Meryl Nass, four who are top of mind and see women without ego searching for what's true. In the same way that you four have science, my own superpower is logic, the Mr. Spock of spirituality, economics, raising children, human nature, domesticity, geopolitics. We think of rationality as the domain of men, especially economics, and so the twisted logic of the systems empowering the parasites goes unchallenged by women. 
Anyway, I just wanted to send that message to you, sister to sister. Logic may be the master's tool, but it can also dismantle the master's house. A new reader, also named Rob, but of Universe C-137, has posted a link to a lecture called The Alphabet Versus the Goddess. In this talk by Leonard Schlein, he, by his same book by that title, looks at how the Dark Ages were paradoxically not a terrible time for women, that there was courtly romanticism and Christian worship of Mary and chivalry, and so that gave women some spiritual and political status. And then the Renaissance came in, and with it, the witch hunts and the denigration of Mary worship or images at all. His tie-in is that literacy started making it where right-handed writing with a pen connected to the left-sided masculine side of the brain and started taking the feminine out and making that into something that was no longer seen as positive. I wonder, though, whether there was a division of labor in the Renaissance, meaning that those wielding the pens weren't doing any, that having the real work with hammers and shovels and trowels being done by servants and slaves meant that perhaps men needed to take over what had been the feminine domains of medicine and the arts in order to have that as their authority. Leonard also looks at the modern day where we do two-handed typing on a computer and that we're always immersed in images, which are the feminine side of the brain, and that things have never been so feminized, he says, as today. But I don't know that images and screen time immerses us really in the feminine world of raising children and cooking and cleaning and talking and listening. Those are all things that I think are interactive and need to be done in the real world. But I think that rather than men being feminized by the computer, we're all being neutered and infantilized by the passive consumer world of the computer. My newlywed daughter and her husband had a rough start to their marriage on New Year's Eve day when they had flooding in their basement apartment in Oakland. After a tense day of emergencies and close calls and lots of stress, they finally decided they had it as much under control as they could and decided to brave the storm and drive down here in order to meet their friends for New Year's Eve. And on the way, my daughter suggested that they each name a time when the other person had been a hero that day. What she named was his genius in figuring out how to connect the sump pump to the wet vac so that they could get the water far away from the house and down a drain. And he's a mechanical engineer and is great at problem solving. He named that she noticed someone in line as they're frantically getting their stuff who had a sump pump and a hose and realized that one was useless without the other and followed directions to get the last one left on the shelf. But I think her real time of being a hero was the hero game because she's a bereavement counselor and great at people solving or at least soothing. Rob Bresney ends his episode on feminine intelligence with 35 ways that men can be feminist written by Pamela Clark. Those were great ideas, but not altogether dissimilar from this Catholic pamphlet from the 1950s that I found while cleaning out my parents' house on how to be a good husband. Some of those haven't aged as well, like don't get angry if dinner is late, but most of them were really timeless. 
I think that Rob should be looking at not what is feminine intelligence, but what is the model of masculinity that he looks to embody. We don't need men telling us what feminine intelligence is, as if we're not smart enough to figure that out on our own or not articulate enough to be able to speak it. As a woman, I want men in the world who are different than me, who both complement by bringing out the best and who complement by admiring that which is utterly foreign. Appreciation is the ultimate aphrodisiac, especially when it sees the particulars and doesn't project its own ideal. There's a beneficial and admiring manliness that makes me happy to have been born a woman. I wouldn't trade it for a tribe of women, although I want that tribe too. So while praising women who are made in his image of perfection, I think that Rob should apply his prodigious imagination to the men who would be their complement, the yang to the yin, or however that goes. I think that if women's intelligence is sublime, maybe male wisdom is grounded in the healthy soil of making things work. And to follow up on making things work, I'm going to suggest The Crisis as Festival by Sarah Chase and What Emerges from the Emergency on Luke Kemp. Thank you for watching my video and check this out with links and text on Third Paradigm Substack.